Hello. We need to start instigating a countdown so that these uh, first few seconds are um, not wasted with me uh, stammering while I wait for people to show up. But <clears throat> welcome to the September 7th, 2023 Century Guild Salon. Um, I can't believe we've been doing this for for over a year now. Uh, so today's is kind of a special one for two reasons. One is that it is uh, the first salon since we have discovered when Caligula is going to be released uh, in America for its uh, premiere. Of course, there'll be other releases after this. Um, but it's premiering September 29th, 24th at Fantastic Fest in Austin. And uh, that's very exciting. I don't uh, think it's a secret, but in case it is, I'll just say there's going to be a very special guest there. Um, of course, besides myself and, and Aaron. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's been obviously years and years of work. And, um, the thing that I know Aaron and I are most excited about is just that we're going to get to watch this movie in a room with a bunch of people. And we've, God help us, watched this movie so many times. And the people that we've worked on the movie with, uh, have seen it time and time and time again. And so, um, you kind of get a little disconnected. I watched, uh, I was trying to gauge how much Helen Mirren footage was in the new version as opposed to the old one. And I hadn't watched the old one in so long and the differences are just so vast. So anyway, so that's a, a super, super exciting uh, thing for us. And then the other is that the Jugendstil book uh, closed today at an amazing price. We did use advertising uh, for the first time kind of wanted to experiment. Kickstarter had partnered with Jellup uh, and, and figured out ways on the back end to use the analytics uh, communally to give the creators a better return on their ad spend. And so I was kind of a guinea pig for that a little bit. Um, but it was, it was very expensive. I will say that to any creators that are listening. But I will also say that it uh, was very much worth it. Very much worth it. Um, so anyway, so you know, creators, we could talk about that on another another campaign. But uh, you know, with make sure you set a good return on investment. Um, but. I will say that I'm uh, definitely pleased. So, uh, Kickstarter ended today, and that was that was really great. There's there's a lot of new people that'll be part of the Century Guild publishing family, which is exciting and interesting. Um, and then next month is Witch Starter on Kickstarter. Something. Uh, that I'm very excited about October, obviously being a great month for the coming of fall and Halloween and all of that. And so, uh, we'll be doing a really cool, uh, salon next month around that. And a, a week from today, so I guess, I don't know if it's when, the 14th, um, I'm going to be doing a thing on Kickstarter's platform, <clears throat> an interview, a Q and a where, I'm the subject and someone from Kickstarter is going to talk to me about crowdfunding. And then the following week, the tables will be turned. I'll be uh, in the uh, mentor seat and a new creator will be in the uh, entry seat um, and we'll be able to, uh, you know, I guess pick my brain on, on what to do to be a successful creator. I guess as I'm saying this out loud, I'm kind of realizing that I'm not really sure what we're gonna be talking about. You can just hand it to me over here. You're off camera. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> thank you. 
so that was uh, the basic rundown. And then the, so one of the things that Jellip, there, there's some things that happened with Jellip. Like I know that they did some emailing with people and we got some complaint emails about that. I don't know if it was because it was unexpected or different, or if there were some ways that Jellip did it that didn't uh, seem comfortable to some people. So we're going to make a post and ask for people to to give us their experiences with Jellip. I will obviously be sharing all of this directly with Kickstarter. Um, but one of the things that was interesting that Jellip did that was helpful uh, is that they did a poll, like an exit poll, uh, that was basically, my allergies are bothering me today. Uh, like a very briefly, why did you decide to back this project? Any suggestions on what we could do to improve the product? Um, and uh, I don't know, maybe a third of the people answered it. But so it was it was interesting for me to see what some of the comments and questions were. There were, you know, of course, I think if people think everything is great, they don't say anything. Um, so a lot of the comments uh, were kind of outliers, but there were some things that did come up uh, more than once that I thought uh, would then be worth addressing. Um, <clears throat> a lot of people asked why these Jugendstil books are six by nine uh, or why they're smaller and why they're paperback, soft cover. And the biggest thing for us is having our books be an entry point for creatives. Um, when we're talking about something as, as bizarre as German Art Nouveau, there's a lot of really academic material out there, but not a lot of, of things that are that kind of um, help ingratiate it into your personal ecosystem. And so if you want to spend $150 on a great, book on Jugendstil, those do exist. Um, you probably have to buy a half dozen of them to get a nice gamut. But if money isn't the issue, there are some great things out there. The thing that I've always felt was lacking, and this was part of why our experience with being present at Comic-Con, I do have my, my Comic-Con t-shirt on, part of our uh, experience there that was so beautiful was that there would be people like I remember how wonderful it was to talk to Bud Plant or Charles Vess or Dave McKean about art and then the other side of that coin was that someone young would come up and, and ask me are you the artist and then it's just that moment of it's kind of like with a band that you know that you're playing for someone that they've never heard or a movie they've never seen. You just have that moment of like, oh my God, you have no idea what you're in for. And then you tell someone, this is Alphonse Mucha, or this is Art Nouveau. Have you heard of Art Nouveau? I, there was one guy that came up. I remember, and this actually happened twice, where people would look at a big Mucha poster and they would ask me, uh, like, is that Adam Hughes? Or is that Joe Quesada? And I would say... No, but good eye. This is an artist that they love. And so if I had my way, every book we made would be a $100 art book because I do love seeing the better paper and the really dense UV spot varnish. And, you know, there's a lot of things about it. I love the bindings like that. I love what we were able to do with that hardcover to make it feel like an old leather bound tome. Um, but it's expensive. It's expensive to do. And we do then price out a lot of people. And so kind of in our hierarchy, um, the first rule of service is education. Uh, that is where my heart is. That is far and away the thing that's most important to me. And so if you love beautiful art books, we do want to fulfill that need. There's a couple that we'll be doing next year that I know will be extraordinary. We've already done that beautiful little Cheshka book. We already did Beautiful Macabre will be shipping the hardcover ships in January. Um, and of course, the two editions of La Pater, the, the hardcover is magnificent. 
and we really bent over backwards to make the soft cover feel like a hard cover type of experience. So for the $50 and up crowd, we do have really boutique art books. Um, but with these Jugendstil books, we really want to cover a lot of artists, do a lot of biographical information, and really get a lot of people hooked on these artists whose names they wouldn't otherwise be coming across in American publications in, in English uh, literature. Um, and then last thing I guess really I could address is that one person did say, did address that our Berlin Girls series are very thin on the description. Um, I have to say, like I've had more than one person tell me that that's their favorite book that we've done. And I always laugh a little bit and I think, but that's the one that I didn't write anything in. It's just pictures. <laughs> so it's kind of like, uh, oh, that was a great movie. You weren't in it. But the, the reason we did that with the Berlin Girls books is that it's kind of fantasy fair. Germany was, was crushed under the boot heel of depression, financial, uh, sociological, ecological, everything in the world that could be wrong. And so these magazines were kind of escapism. And so when I'm writing about like a silent film poster that's related directly to what was happening in consciousness of the era, I can really get deep with it. And I can, even if I just write a few sentences in, in books like, um, uh, I don't remember the book names, uh, the one with the uh, infernal creatures, you know, where it's really light on commentary, but I'm just trying to give you enough, like I'm walking you through it. Um, with Berlin Girls, I, that wasn't really possible because it's like pinup fair. It really was uh, escapism. And there are a few things that you could say, but not a lot. And the illustrators, the periodical illustrators from that period, for the most part, there is nothing that I could find on many of them. And, you know, I've spent tens and tens and tens of thousands of dollars on periodicals and research and, and books and, you know, everything just specifically relating to that decade in Germany. So when I say there's not a lot out there, it means they weren't in the newspapers, they weren't in the magazines, and unless you know someone's grandson happened to write a book or something, which has happened, uh, sometimes I find weird little, you know, like what's the word, like boutique books that they only printed a hundred of because it was their grandfather or something like that. And I love those. I love being able to share that information. Excuse me. Um, so that's why the Berlin Girls books are are as light as they are. I think that uh, I feel like. <clears throat> the beautiful macabre one I'm really proud of. Obviously, the Le Pater book is the one that I'm most proud of. That's the one where I said everything that I needed to say without rushing. You can read it in one sitting, but there's little tendrils there that if you want to follow, uh, they can lead you to much deeper places. Um, and then uh, I think that Jugendstil, I think that this series that we're going to do is going to be uh, in that middle part where I, I think that I'm going to, um, as I'm finishing it, I think it's important for people to know who the artists are. I think that it'll be probably really close to what we did with the Orchid Garden series. I think that a lot of the art needs to speak for itself because it's, a drawing of a satyr or a mermaid or uh, a landscape. Like there's not a lot you can say about it. Um, but I will be making sure that I, uh, even if they're not identified in the magazine because of the century of literature, uh, we're going to be able to identify all the artists. And I think that's super important. Um, the last Kickstarter went really, really, really well. 
And so right now, the conversation today was what great stuff can we throw into the package and kind of pull some of that excess that we experienced back in uh, to give the people who supported the Kickstarter something really special, um, you know, for their support for making this thing happen. When we have such large quantities, I think it was almost a thousand people <clears throat> back to this one. It does, uh, you know, things cost average. Our expenses are kind of fixed on a lot of things. So when we get a large number of backers like this, it does give us a little more to play with. Um, and so part of that we use to pulling ahead on another project, but we do want to turn some of that back in to kind of, to not kind of, to directly show our gratitude. Um, and so because, so we're kind of kind of make a 90 degree turn here. It's 15 minutes in. Uh, if you haven't come to the salon before, the reason that we do these is that when we had the gallery for 20 years, my favorite part was at the end of the evening when the show would be, you know, as technically closed, but <clears throat> you would uh, have a couple dozen people hanging out and chatting about art and sitting in the Art Nouveau salon section and... Um, and even just kind of doing private tour, pulling something out of a drawer. And, and so we try to get into to little different things. And because a lot of what we've done after closing the gallery is shifting into publishing and, and the filmmaking, um, the first thing that we did in film, when we decided that we were going to stop doing Comic-Con, I was like, God, that's such, that's like a huge, huge part of our summer um, and a big expense. I was like, well, what are we going to spend the money on? Uh, of course, not get it back, but it was like, you know, you kind of had this budgeted for that summer. And um, what are we going to do with this time? And so uh, my good friend, Aaron, and I decided we would make a short film. It was something we both always wanted to do. It was something that uh, we were passionate about. Our very good friend, Rob, is a brilliant actor. And so Aaron had the story kicking around that we we pulled together and, and then made the short film Aurora, which is actually playing, I think, October 16th or 17th in LA. Uh, I'll post things on social media for that. Um, <clears throat> but so we did that. We started making a, a, a movie on 16 millimeter, Super 16 with Jake Busey. And wound up getting sidetracked into this Caligula project. And so anybody that's following our stuff has been hearing me talk about it for three years. It was a major restoration. We had 96 hours of footage. We rebuilt the movie from scratch, um, found the performances in there. And the thing then, because this is literally the last salon before, what do you call them, citizens? Before people who didn't work on the movie got to see the movie. Um, this is kind of the last time. So we, we figured that hopefully there's some Caligula fans in here. And if you had any questions about the footage or, uh, you know, myth versus legend or things like that, uh, the only person who knows as much as Caligula, God help me as I do, is the man who has watched all the footage many, 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 many times. He is, uh, handsome, he's charming, he's terrifying, and, uh, he can bench press, uh, rhinoceros, and his name is Aaron Shapps. Uh, I'm a little, I'm a little embarrassed right now. I was under the impression we were going to be talking about my action figure collection, <laughs> so I'm woefully unprepared for this discussion. I was misled. What's up, you beautiful man? <laughs> How's it going? Hello, everybody. Uh, so I, I see a couple questions in here already. One thing that's going to probably head off a lot of questions is if there are questions about where it will be playing or what will happen with the DVD, all that stuff. Um, a phrase that I keep using 
is that that is above my pay grade. And I have found that as a blanket statement, that works really well. Um, I know where the next three screenings are. Uh, I know that it's going to be uh, Austin, Los Angeles, and Sitges in Spain. But I can't tell you the LA details yet, but it will be public news within the next 10 days. Uh, I don't think there's anybody here from Spain, so I don't know that I really blew anything by outing that will be at that film festival. Uh, and then, of course, Fantastic Fest, which we're excited about. But um, as as far as, you know, I... I, I I've been lobbying really hard for a limited theatrical release. All the input that I've been getting is that it'll make a huge difference in the way that it's able to expand out further into the world. So I've been passing that up the food chain. I don't know uh, if it's resonating or not. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, the sales agents, it, it'll, if, if, this is mostly Americans in here. We know it's happening in France. We know there's going to be theatrical release in France, Germany, I believe the UK. Um, but we don't have details on that stuff yet. Uh, and then the other thing is same thing with DVD, Blu-ray. Um, again, like, you know, I have my fantasy of what this looks like, but we did finish in 4K. The footage is beautiful beautiful and when i compare it to the old disc it's like eight track tape to cd it's so 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 different and i love the idea of people getting to see that in in beautiful lush 4k um but again that's not up to us each country buys the rights and then they do their thing with it um and in america i think that uh you know, I would imagine in the next month or two that a lot of decisions will get made, but just none of that stuff has been made yet. So the stuff that we know a lot more about is <clears throat> like the IMDB rumors, which is that they uh, theoretically had three women with like newly born children on set so they could rush one over and as Aaron will attest, uh, part of his task was making the edit look like it wasn't really, really bad styrofoam prosthetics because there was, in fact, no newly newly birthed children on the set. Um, but we've got the, the chat here. So if anybody has questions that are about, and hi, Andrew Humbly from the UK. Um, if anybody has questions that are related to Caligula, we can answer them. Otherwise, I might just go to the IMDb uh, rumors section. Or action figures. I'm here for... <coughs> Do you want to show them your... Uh... I actually have Caligula action figures behind me. There's uh, Well, that's Bob Guccione. And then there's uh, Tiberius over there. So <clears throat> they do exist. Uh, yeah, because Eric we made them. Can we can we let the secret out of the bag that Aaron was the voice of Bob Guccione in the Caligula action oh, in figure our commercial? Commercials? Yeah, yeah, that was fun. That got people on Reddit like that quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what I can find here. I mean, I, I will say, as far as the baby is concerned, just because you brought that up. There were shots in the scene where Helen Mirren's character gives birth, where it was literally like a five-point articulation plastic baby doll that you would buy in a <laughs> toy store, <clears throat> and not even a nice doll, like not even a doll that a yeah. kid would be excited about. You know what I mean? Like a really crappy, scary one. Yeah. It is, yes. I do remember that, and I remember laughing the other thing is that there's a part at the end where a particularly grotesque murder takes place. <laughs> and all I will say is that when you see it in the film, it's really distressing. All you need to get over that is to watch 10 seconds on either direction because it is so clearly 
a cheap mannequin. Uh, you know, to the to the point where there are there there are side shots of the mannequin being killed, and you can actually see like the seam on the mannequin's <laughs> wrist where the hand you could pose in the store or whatever. I mean, this yeah. <clears throat> it is a and it is a mannequin thing, for a department store. The other thing I remember when uh, Aaron cut together the banquet scene and showed it to me. And I had, you know, half comment, perhaps half complaint, where I said, well, why aren't we seeing Helen Moore from the front? And then he showed me the footage that we had to work with. And she had this prosthetic baby belly that was just not even remotely mm. the same color flesh. And so he very artfully used the footage where there was... Uh, the smoke from the incensors in front of it and then a lot of kind of side and back shots and so there there were a few things where the i mean considering how much they spent on sets and costumes and even things like the harem of monsters where some of those prosthetics are outstanding the the two the mannequin the doll and the belly were were pretty weak we do have a question here from <clears throat> forest where he's curious about the digital enhancements that needed to be made to the movie for the cut. Would they have been possible, say, 10 or 20 years ago? I'm going to make one quick response, and then we'll ask Aaron this question. I'm going to say this uh, about the audio specifically, which is that there were a couple weird delays that we had that were frustrating to me. And then... I, this thing just keeps coming up that my friend Michael said, things don't happen to you, they happen for you. And some of the things that, that happened with AI technology that Peter Jackson was using for Get Back that allowed the computer learning to separate human voice from its surroundings it's not noise reduction, it's not a frequency. Like it was literally sculpting pieces. There, the scene with John Gielgud in the bath was a scene that I thought that's the one we're going to make the excuses for. We're going to have to put a disclaimer at the front end saying this was made from, you know, blah, blah, blah sources. And by the end of this thing, the length of time that it took just that last year, the technology changed so much that we were able to get his voice sounding immaculate. And the irony, Kevin uh, was our audio uh, magician on this. And he said this to me, this was his idea that I'm sharing. He's like, you know, it's really funny. That was the worst sounding scene. And now at the end, it's like, that's kind of the best sounding scene. <clears throat> and it's just because, you know, it's like, where are you putting your budget? Where are you putting your attention? And we poured a lot onto that. And it, absolutely is perfect sonically and it, it couldn't have been even 12 months earlier and Aaron uh because of the movie stuff that Aaron and I work on together Aaron is way more versed in unreal engine and the universe of effects like so how much of what we did in this was new technology versus did you know we we put in some why don't you explain what we did like with the backgrounds? Sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. My allergies and, and, and why and why, why we did it. Absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, I, I actually really appreciate the question because I think there's been a lot of misunderstanding about what the CGI was used for on our end. Um, you know, this is not a situation where Jar Jar Binks is going to be hanging out at one of the banquets with Caligula and, and Helen Mirren and everything like that. What happened was... There were tremendous delays in this production originally at every at every stage, and they needed to begin shooting principal photography before all the sets had been completed. So a lot of what we used um, the CGI for was just literally to complete sets that they shot on before they were completed. And so what they would do 
there would be huge portions of the set where they just hung a tarp, so you know, a pink tarp or a red tarp, a red can a curtain or a pink curtain, whatever it is, because literally behind it was nothing. It was an you know a, a a frame for a set that hadn't been finished. So in a lot of scenes, what we did was we just removed those and we extended the sets. We finished the sets. So for someone who's never seen the theatrical cut of this movie, you will not know where the CGI is because it's literally just a third of the set on the right hand side is now there where it wasn't there before or let me a low angle it. shot. Let me just cut in to say yeah. one thing too. When you look at the 1980 version, the resolution, when the way we're seeing it, which is, you know, DVD taken from a not great print. So it's dark and low resolution. A lot of these things just go black. The problem that we had is we were working in 4K. From so the original negative. Right. From the negative. Negative <clears throat> 4K. So that wall that went black in the version you're familiar with, well, now you can see there's drywall seams or, you know, or that it's plywood. So that was one of the things is this wasn't just like, oh, why couldn't you just leave it black? It was like, no, no, no. Like this, we did like the edit, Aaron and I kept saying is for Malcolm. The work that we did digitally was for Danilo Donati. So when people that are kind of, you know, choosing to be negative about it, are saying, well, why would you go in and do that? It's like, because we respect that set designer so much, we know he didn't get a chance to finish. You see the quality and then you see right where it ends. But the thing that I just wanted to add to what Aaron was saying was just the difference that the original camera negative and a 4K scan makes was like turning the lights on in the bar at 3 a.m., and all the atmosphere goes away and it's just a sticky floor and, you know, dirty booths. <laughs> so anyway, please continue if there's anything else you were thinking, but that was the, that was a big part of our decision making. The, the only other thing I was going to uh, say that, that, I mean, that covers it with the, the backgrounds. The only other thing I was going to say is one thing that we saw and you may have noticed if you've seen the theatrical cut there are really no exterior establishing shots of any location whatsoever and in the 70s that would have been done using matte paintings you know a lot of incredible movies were done with matte paintings like 50 percent of star wars is matte paintings um but uh, you know we didn't instead of doing that there were a couple instances where we wanted an establishing shot outside. And so that was created digitally. It would have just been a matte painting had we done it in the 70s. That's how they would have done it. But what we were able to do, well, for one in particular, what we were able to do is uh, we wanted an establishing shot before you get to Peter O'Toole's Tiberius's villa. And our effects guy, John, he was able to actually take an image of what the coast of Italy would look like from Capri and create a digital, essentially a digital matte painting with that. So again, really, it, it's just a matter of either completing sets that Danilo didn't have a chance to complete because of the insane shooting schedule and how behind everything was from day one, uh, or just an establishing shot. I mean, it, it's we haven't tinkered digitally with anything. We've we just completed things that were incomplete. In the Italian version, I don't know if you know this, Aaron, but they use stock footage to make that establishing shot of a sunrise okay. coming up, uh, which is just kind of funny that they literally had the same idea. Uh, and the thing that was just kind of the reason I was smiling when you were saying that is, um, yeah, he, John, literally John, John Lipishak is our effects guy. And he literally, I was on the phone with him for hours. Just, I was working. We were just literally talking while he was working and he was sending me pictures and he 
was able with a satellite to get the horizon and then redraw it and make it look like 16 millimeter footage. And, and it's just a few seconds, but one of the things that, that, um, happened with this movie is that everything is shot very flat almost like it's an opera and so there's a movie called messalina messalina that they filmed on the sets of caligula and it's funny how much better they use the sets in terms of they put cameras in different places you're outside there's a market square and uh, one of the things that happened with Caligula is the reason there's no establishing shot of the big pleasure ship is because the production was so troubled, everybody hated each other so much, that they built the ship so big that there was nowhere in the room where you could put a camera. Um, and so... Every, it's just the thing reason that on, on purpose it was it yeah, was, on purpose they did that just to, to screw with the, yeah but so the reason i mentioned that is because there are all these things that are kind of fighting with the things you would normally do as a filmmaker to give a sense of scale and so it's not just that they didn't think to do it it's that the the uh the civil war that was happening on set affected that as well. So it's a, you know, it was nice that one thing, and this I credit Aaron with this, is that Aaron really uh, was thought it was important to show a lot more of the sets than anybody mm. had seen in 1980. Um, and so that's something that is a, is a big difference that I think is really pleasant. And then, uh, you know, the only other thing, this doesn't really give it away too much. You wouldn't notice it, but there are some things that we did where if you're looking through a window or you're looking outside where before it might have been just a piece of fabric hanging, we were able to put a rock wall extending or different things, but you really shouldn't notice it. Um, and I think that unless you're going into it looking for it, uh, I think that 99% of it, you're not going to notice. <clears throat> um, yeah. I, I think, I think there's no question that if you haven't seen the original version, you will not even know where the CGI is. I don't I, think. I was also just thinking that the things people are going to say, Oh, that's CGI. You and I would laugh and be like, no, that was actually yeah, exactly. It's like there's the shot where it's Tiberius's harem of monsters. The lighting is so pink, yeah, that I think you would look at that and say, oh, well, that's clearly CGI. And then when Malcolm is standing on that rock face, and it looks like something from Masters of the Universe. It's my favorite scene. <laughs> but you would look at that and think, oh, well, that can't be real. It's like, no, they yeah. really built that out of styrofoam and plaster. And you that, know, that set though, that's a <clears throat> that's a great example of just some of the odd choices that were made in the edit originally in terms of what was and wasn't used, because there's a beautiful crane shot that we use that's like a reveal of that set where people are of, of that castle gray skull looking set where uh tiberius and caligula and a few other characters are coming up these stairs that are in the floor and the camera is on it's on, on a jib arm and it tilts up and reveals that set behind them and there that shot wasn't used uh in the original and it's such a shame because and we use it and it's such a great reveal of that set but I, I did want to say as far as showing the sets, you know, that was definitely something that that we talked about when when we talked about the whole idea of, you know, one, once you and I had looked at what we had and we kind of came up with this thing, you said it first, but I, I completely understood what you meant of sort of leaning into the visuals and kind of trying to make this like the 1970s European graphic novel version of a Roman epic. At that point, it really, you know, I, I knew that the best thing for us to do editing wise was to lean into those visuals, to lean into those sets. Well, let me interrupt and, and, to you know, say why is you and I are listening to all these interviews where Bob 
Guccione is talking about how historically accurate it's going to be. And Gore Vidal is talking yeah. about the most, you know, gripping historical. And then we're like, I don't remember three-story elevators yeah. in ancient Rome. I don't remember two-story decapitation machines. Yeah. So it's almost like we had to reconcile, like, what were these guys? Like, it doesn't, like, the, the, the language and the visuals didn't make sense. And so we, we were trying to figure out how to be respectful to everyone. And then we just did reach a point where I remember saying that, God, I'm, I think we have to treat this like a 1970s, you know, like a Yodorowsky Manara graphic novel. And in that moment, I remember you said, yeah, that makes sense. And from that point forward, then I just remember lean that. into it. Yeah. But the reason that, that he brought that up, the reason that was such a big moment is because you're watching this and you're like, what? You know, for the first year at least, it's like, what is this movie? You're watching the footage, something, and this is another, you know, Aaron said this. He's like, if you watch it, the Italian actors are acting like they're in a comedy. And the British actors are kind of taking it straight. And Malcolm's throwing everything at the wall to kind of see what sticks. Like there wasn't really anyone that was directing, you know, like here's what the final vision is. And so, you know, it wasn't like we could just look at the footage and say, oh, this is what they meant to do. Um, but again, the high drama, like why is the sky pink? Why is the light purple? Another really funny thing, I'm saying this to make you laugh because I've had countless discussions with Johnny Lips on this, with the VFX and even more with the greater is like, where is the light coming from? Like, the sunrise is happening over here, but all the light in the scene is coming from the other side. Well, that's when you got to go comic book with it. Like, in your head, you got to be like, this is not, you know, it's not I mean, Claudius, it's not a historical epic. It has to be a comic book. No, to your point, I mean, one of the, one of the things that we learned in the research was that the real problem with this movie in a nutshell is that every single person involved thought they were making a different movie. Guccione thought they were making one movie. Gore thought it was going to be something else. Tinto had his own ideas. Like you said, the cast were playing it all different ways. I think Malcolm and Helen and, and uh, Peter had, and John Gilgood, like you said, the, the British actors had, one idea of what it was i think they did think to a certain degree they were making i claudius or ben hur or something like that and everyone else was in this kind of farce um but yeah i mean so one of the to other that point just for people listening so the thing that aaron was doing was looking for the performances from the italian actors that were straight not the ones where they were whimsical like, how do you get those to line in? Because the thing that we built everything around was Malcolm. Because Malcolm was the guy that was going in. Tinto did some rewriting. Malcolm brought in another writer, Ted Whitehead. They created this interesting character arc. And so that was literally like, that's the North Star for the ship. You know, and it's the one that made the most sense. And it's the one that, again, if you look at it like in a comic booky, you know, and not, I don't mean that in a derogatory way, like in a really beautiful artistic graphic novel kind of way, then you can treat Malcolm's performance really respectfully and kind of make the other actors fall in line with the benefit of the time machine that is the editing suite. One of the other things we had talked about too, along with the the kind of European graphic novel angle, was because the sets were so over the top, and because so many of the performances, even Malcolm, when he's at his best in this movie, he's he's really chewing the scenery. He's you know he's turned up to eleven. So we kind of leaned into the whole thing as more of an experience than a film, meaning. You're going to come into this thing. You're going to sit down. You're going to be bombarded with images, with visuals. You're going to be hit with these sort of bombastic performances. 
you're going to be hit with this really cool uh, all new score by Troy, our composer. And it's just going to kind of take you on this ride for for three hours, basically, where, um, you know, I, I think for me, that was really true to the spirit of maybe something that would have been done in the late 70s. I really tried to sort of role play that I was editing this in the late 70s and not look at anything after the mid to late 70s in terms of inspiration that wouldn't have been available to me then. And I know, Tom, you had told Troy to only use instruments that would have been available at that time. And so I really just was trying to get in the head of, okay, what would an editor working on this, seeing what there is to work with, what would the approach be? And the approach is just to sort of go full operatic, like you said. I mean, it was really the only way to make it work. There's a, a movie that Aaron and I have a disagreement on, which is uh, Gods of Egypt. <laughs> and I love that movie. And I said, because in my head, I'm listening to Queen the whole time. If I just watch the movie the way it was released, I don't think, I think they made a lot of bad decisions. It's preposterous. It is a preposterous <laughs> movie. Which is why in my head, instead of the classical music, and so I just remembered that and I thought, God, you know, the context in which you present something is everything. And I thought, God, with, with Caligula, we've got these huge sets, beautiful performances, especially from Malcolm McDowell and Helen Mirren. And I was like, how do you make people take those performances seriously and look at these big sets as being a benefit and not a distraction. And to me, the music was that glue that if you look at this, like it's a rock opera that then that kind of turning the volume up on certain frequencies to 11 of parts of Malcolm's dynamics or the you know the sexuality of the film or god especially those sets and the crazy lighting i think that um i think that the thing that people are going to really really react to whether consciously or unconsciously is how amazing the soundtrack is and troy did a magnificent job and when they made the movie originally, they wanted it to be like a 1950s epic. And I, my dictum with everything was, no, no, no. This was filmed in 1976, released in 1980. So like to Troy, I was like, I keep saying the word like. With Troy, I said, just the line is 1980. You should use instruments. Don't go 1950s. Don't go classical. Don't try to go Roman. What would you do, you know, Tangerine Dream? We talked a lot about Rick Wakeman and Brian Eno. It's like, what would, if this was going to be a cutting edge movie in 1979, what would that look like? What would that sound like? And so, yeah, to me, I had to defer to Kevin in the mix for the volume because my attitude was to keep turning the music up because I wanted it to feel like you were, watching an opera and it also then kind of works with the fact that the the everything is shot like it's on a proscenium so that kind of worked and i will say that that was uh that was one of the first things that malcolm said when he saw it was he complimented the music and i don't know if i swear if it'll uh flag this video on youtube but it was a very positive and very uh enthusiastic affirmation on Troy's behalf. And I agree. I think it's great. Forrest, it's above my pay grade. I don't know. <laughs> Is it going to be released on vinyl? I want that desperately for Troy. Troy Sterling niece is uh, not just a great composer, but he's wonderful to work with. And I think that um, I think that if 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 more work comes out of this for him, that's a really good thing. But even better is if people start to understand how much great music he's 
got in him, uh, then I think that a vinyl release will help more people know who he is and what he does. Uh, the only real challenge there is that there's a lot of music in this movie. It's a three hour film. There's over two hours of music. I mean, how many LPs is that? That would be like a five LP set, you know? So I think things are going to have to get kind of selected as far as vinyl, but, uh, yeah, hopefully. And then the other thing too, I mean, I don't know if people do physical media, there's all the original music from the original film, some of which is really fantastic. I really love uh, the Isis music from the 1980 version. I like what we did better, but I, I like theirs in that setting. And then there's a lot of music that was never used uh, that we found. Um, so, you know, maybe some kind of boutique a uh, compact disc releasing entity will say, we would love to do a three disc set or, or you know, whatever. Um, so yeah, if anyone knows anyone, send them my way and I will uh, do my best to help them make that happen. But yeah, the music is beautiful, 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 beautiful. And uh, I think you guys will be really surprised. Some of it's very disconcerting and the only notes that i kept giving to troy ever were either wow that's perfect or push it further and he would say oh yeah i was playing it a little safe because you never know it's a job you know um and i was like oh no no like just i want to hear more of you like, this is this is not the movie to play it safe yeah <laughs> you know? yeah and also, too, because he's so talented. Like, literally, I felt like my job with him was just getting him to feel more <clears> comfortable <throat> being him. And maybe that's through my own lens of what I think he is. But the point is, there's not a second uh, of this movie sonically that I'm not completely thrilled with. And the music is is amazing. I'm, you know, and uh, the trailer is a good example. That music is uh, from the decapitation machine scene, and that's a really good example of kind of tonally what's really different about this version. I read that Tinto Brass is taking legal action against Penthouse over this version of the film. Will this affect its release? I am going to venture into conspiracy theory territory and tell you uh, if you, so that was a Variety Magazine article that quotes uh, an, a press release that was published in La Publicita in Italy, or La Repubblica, La Repubblica. And if you click that link and read that article, that is not what the article says. So I don't fault you for, trusting variety because they would seem like a valid source. Um, but that is not, uh, it's not even what, it's not only not accurate, it's not even what Variety's source said. So I don't want to make any enemies in the journalistic community, but it was clickbait. Uh, and <clears throat> I mean, the, the bottom rights, line is yeah. the bottom the line is were sewn yeah. up decades ago. Yeah, I mean the the bottom line is that Tinto was upset because someone misinformed him that the new version of the film was being promoted as a director's cut with his name attached, which has never happened. Well, so allegedly that is what was. I mean, that's the other thing too is like he didn't come out publicly and say anything. This was a press release that. Yeah, came from his address. So we don't know what he knows or doesn't know, but the point is that... Um, I'm, I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt and being generous. Yes. Well, not him. I mean, you know, he's a 90-year-old man. We don't know what yeah. he knows. And the thing Aaron was referring to is that what this press release said was that the movie had been promoted at the Cannes Film Festival as being his film which was also not true. Uh, so, 
you know, I mean, I think it's just kind of people looking for something to write about when I think the thing that's infinitely more exciting is that Malcolm saw the movie and after 50 years of, you know, of, of distancing himself from this horrible experience feels like his words were that uh, one of his best performances was rescued. Like to me, that's more exciting, but it's not negative clickbait. So it, you know, doesn't spread the same way. Uh, Which is sad because you would think that the bigger story would be that a, a legendary actor feels like a really important performance from early in his career has been resurrected and vindicated, but that's not how it works. Well, let's talk about America now. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to see it soon. I know. Well, no, I meant like, you know, the social dilemma, the way that mm. media works with spreading yeah. negative. And yeah. So Aaron, what else? we got four minutes left. What do you want people to know about uh, Caligula? Uh, I mean... I'm just very excited to see for, for, for everyone to see what we've done. Um, you know, it's, it's not a movie that I can certainly recommend everyone see because there's challenging subject matter to say the, it's, it's age inappropriate for many people. Bob Buccioni, ch I challenge every American to see this film. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, but, but, um, I think that for anyone who's interested, anyone who's seen the original should give this one a shot because it's so vastly different that hopefully if you saw the original and your thought was, well, there that could have been a good movie if, well, I really think that we've, we've shown you what that if is. And I think that anyone who's interested in film history or interested, you know, this is, at the time, this was the most expensive independent production ever. So it is a significant yeah. movie in, in movie history. Unfortunately, it's become kind of a punchline in the subsequent decades for a lot of reasons. But um, I don't think that it deserves that. And, and Malcolm and Helen and, and the, the rest of the cast always said that they shot a good film that just no one had seen. And I'm just really, really, really proud to have been a part of this team that found that good film and now people are going to see it one thing that i think is funny is that um if you loved the original i do think you'll love this one because everything that made the first one crazy and weird is still present and there's a plot it, and there's a plot like that's the thing so it's like it's all the stuff and if people say, oh, but it doesn't have a 12 minute orgy, it's like, but you still have that. Don't you wonder, like when this shot cut and our edit goes for another four minutes or another 10 minutes or whatever, it's almost like you now have the ability, if you're obsessed with that first version, to kind of float a little bit in that universe and see conversations that you never saw before camera angles that you never saw before the last hour of the film is almost completely scenes that were never in the original and then the the funny part this is why i said it's funny is that if you hated the first one well then you'll probably love this one too because everything that you could list as a complaint about the first one nine out of ten have been rectified like if you just said oh no it's it's you know, grotesque, all the nudity and stuff bothers me. It's still a grotesque movie. There's still an extraordinary amount of sex and nudity. But in the context of a plot, it feels so much more vibrant and relevant and important that it sits more with Game of Thrones than any kind of like cult nonsense that it would have had before. Um, I guess one last question that uh, I think is the question on everyone's mind is what's your favorite action figure in your collection there? Oh my God. Oh, in my collection? Yeah. Uh, Why, do you, whoa, whoa, whoa. Do you have a favorite that you don't own? Well, I mean, I have, there are favorites from my childhood that are in my parents' basement in Indiana. Oh. But uh, of, of my current collection, probably the uh, 
Hot Toys one sixth scale Luke Skywalker <laughs> on the shelf behind me. I thought for a minute I was gonna find out some some nerd culture secret, which is like, oh, I do have a favorite. I mean, there's like, some stuff that I want. You know, there's a seven hundred and forty dollar uh completely it's got human organs inside it blah, 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 and i <laughs> well that's limited edition there's no way i could get one of those at this point they're all his name is mark hamill <laughs> that's right and i keep him in a glass right. case yeah well we are at our hour mark and uh there are no more questions so instead of rambling for another hour you and i can do that privately but uh thank you to everybody who was here tonight and um I do try to answer any questions that come in on my Patreon, which is patreon.com slash Thomas Nagovin. And of course, if you're following Century Guild or if you're following any of the social media stuff, I know Aaron's on Instagram, but not Facebook, Aaron underscore Shaps. Um, but yeah, you guys can ask questions uh, online and I always try to answer what I can. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, I, we, we try to do these to be present for our community. And so um, I'm incredibly grateful for everybody who takes the time to show up. Uh, and we are here for this community. Um, so we don't ever want to talk at you. We're talking with you, speaking with you. So uh, if you watch these and you've got questions and you're shy, please make sure you ask them because um, under any other circumstances, this would just be happening in a room with a bunch of people hanging out, being friendly. It's just the nature of the internet that that we can only see you as a, as a text thread. Um, but you're very appreciated and we're grateful that you're here. So uh, thank you. Uh, first Thursdays of every month, it's 6 p.m. Pacific time we show up and uh next month maybe i don't know mark hamill might be in aaron's living room in a glass i'll let him out we don't know out for this <laughs> so thank you and we'll see you next month and if you are uh in austin hopefully we'll see you at fantastic fest uh so there you go thank you thank you for being here <laughs>